Take your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And we will begin reading in a moment in verse 12. As I was in my study this morning, while many of you were in classes and small group in the Sunday school hour, I, I tend to spend that time praying for this service. Not so much for my sermon, but for this service. And I, I always try to take the order of worship and just kind of pray through it and looking at the hymns we'll be singing, scriptures that will be read, uh, things that will be said, in addition to uh, what the sermon says. And, and it struck me this morning as I started looking at these hymns that we sang, Come and pray, come praise and glorify, all I have is Christ. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Come behold the wondrous mystery. And, and I started thinking, why do we sing those hymns? Why do we sing hymns at all? Why do, we, why do we come together and spend at least half the time just singing hymns and songs? And as Paul said to the Colossians and the Ephesians, hymns and songs and spiritual psalms and spiritual songs. Why do we do that? In one real sense of the word, we do that for the same reason that we come to this table. We do it to help us remember we, we do it to help us focus. Someone once said that, well, we sing to prepare ourselves for the sermon. That is absolutely, totally wrong. And if that's why you're doing it, you're doing it all wrong. So I want to help you out this morning, okay? I want to exegete the service just for a minute. We come together and spend those times in singing songs to help us remember the greatness of Christ. Help us remember the greatness of his sacrifice. Help us remember the work that he has done on our behalf, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. We come together and we sing those songs in order to lift our hearts and our spirits to him and say, Lord, we worship you, we glorify you, we honor you, we, we, we worship you. And to remind us of the great work of Christ. That's what this table does. It reminds us of the great work of Christ. And so we, we sing songs like Come Praise and Glorify. That, that's really a, a song of calling us to worship. It's a song of saying, listen, come together. Let's praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ, in Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poured. For, for pure and blameless in his sight he destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through his Son eternally. That's just the first verse. But it talks a lot about good doctrine there, about our relationship with Christ. He has blessed us by giving us his son. He desires for us to be holy and blameless before him. And that's the work of sanctification in our life. And we'll one day be there in perfect perfection before him. But now, in this life, we've been adopted into his family through his son. And adopted not for a period of time in which he might decide then to back off of it, but we've been adopted in his son eternally for all time. It reminds us that our purpose here is to worship him and glorify him. And then we sang, All I Have is Christ. And, and as I prayed, that, that song had really moved me in the prayer time to think about exactly what we were saying. And I, I prayed about that. What he's saying here is that there are many idols in our life that, help us, uh, that keep us from seeing that really, is, that really all we do have is Christ. It's not our good works. It's not our religious ritual. It's not our trying to be better and trying to do better and, and maybe God will say, okay, you, you, you're all right. But it's, it's us saying, and all I have is Christ, and if, if I don't have Christ, I don't have anything. I mean, the wealthiest man on earth. I mean, the most powerful dictator or president or prime minister on earth. If I don't have Christ, all that goes away. I don't have anything. All I have is Christ. Because, you know, once, once, at one time, every one of us who are in Christ now, at one time, we were lost in darkest night. We thought we knew the way. 
We thought our way was the way. Maybe it was religion. Maybe it was secularism. Maybe it was atheism. Maybe it was something that was just pure hedonism, just trying to fill our life with all the joy and pleasure that we possibly could. We thought we knew the way. But that sin in that life that told us it was going to give us joy in life was really leading us to a grave, to death, spiritual death, alienation from the God who created us for fellowship with him. Had no hope, had no hope in that situation that God Almighty would own me because I was a rebel to his will, but he loved me and he graced me and he cared for me, but if he hadn't done that, I'd still refuse him. Hmm. I could quote that whole song because the, the, mean, the words mean so much. I remember the first time I sang it, I, uh, we were at the conference we were just at this past week, the staff and at that time, it was just a staff, I think. I'm not sure any layman went with us. This week, we had some other people with us at the conference. But I was there in Louisville, Kentucky, in a much smaller room than we were in this past week in the Yum Center with 10,000 people. I think there were only about 3,000 or 4,000 there at that time. But I remember we stood and sang that song, sang it several times. And each time we sang it, I wept, hearing it the first time, recognizing how my sin is great. But his grace is greater. His grace is more than sufficient. It is super efficient and sufficient. Then we sang praise to the Lord the Almighty. Basically saying the same thing we did in the one that we called ourselves to worship on. That first hymn that we sang and praise and glorify his name. We, we sing to the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation. Who gives us health and salvation who draws us near to his presence, that we might join in adoration together. The idea of together is in all these hymns. It's not that I'm out on an island somewhere by myself and I'm singing and I'm really enjoying a, 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 a worship, private worship service with God. Nothing wrong with that. We ought to do that. But really the focus for us coming on Sunday morning is that we come together to sing these praise songs, to sing these hymns, seeing these expressions of faith, confessions of faith in music. And then we sang the song that I wake up to every morning, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. I use my phone as an alarm clock in the morning and it's set to wake me up to come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the king. It's usually as far as it gets before I hit the off button. But nonetheless, it wakes me up every morning reminding me, as we were reminded today, that, you know, it is a mystery that God became man and dwelt among us. It's a mystery that God exists in three persons. And it's, we've sung about that this morning, you know, that, that he is the eternal three in one. He is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but only one God. And, and that's a mystery, folks. We, we acknowledge that all the time. We praise him for it. We thank him for it. We believe it because his word reveals it. But it is a mystery. Some people say, well, if I can't understand it, I can't believe it. Let me tell you something, I believe it and I don't understand it. I don't understand the great gift of salvation by God's grace that he's given to me. Because I don't deserve it. Neither do you. But it's a wondrous mystery, the dawning of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, he, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. I mean, he became man that we might live and know him. Well, I won't read the whole hymn to you, but it's, it's such a tremendous statement of faith. And when we sing that together, we, we express not just, our, not just our love for God, although we express it, but we express our covenant and our community with one another, our fellowship with one another, which is what we're going to talk about this morning when it comes to the Lord's table. We do it together. For His glory but for our good. We do it together that we might encourage one another through the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, as Paul says. 
Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, I, my, my voice could be a discouragement to some people, I suppose. It's not the talent of a voice. It's not the ability of the singer. It's the content of the, of the thought and the words that we speak to one another in. I'm often told by family, Dad, turn it down a little. I'm making a joyful noise, but maybe not a joyful, melodious tune. But I'm thankful God never said, make a joyful, melodious tune. He said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye peoples, for he is worthy of our praise. Well, all that's extra. But it just hit me this morning as I was praying for this service and for you. As I do every Sunday morning back in my study before we come in here, as I was praying, it just struck me. These hymns, straighten, they remind us, they help us remember, they focus us not on the sermon. They focus upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They focus, upon the one who is, focus us upon the one who is worthy of our adoration, worthy of, worthy of our praise, worthy to be glorified by his holy name. Mm. But in Mark chapter 14, we read about the observance of the Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper or the, and the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. Hear the words of the Lord as we read about this. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, You go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. On one of the days this past week, or two week, a week ago in Jerusalem, it was amazing to not be in the same room that that took place, but be in the same area where that took place, thinking about that night when he observed the Passover with his disciples. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as, as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. One who is right here in this room observing the Passover with me. One of you is going to betray me. And they began to be grieved, surely saying, why would anyone do that, Lord? You're the king of kings. You're the, you're the glorious son of God. You are the Messiah. You are the one who has come to set your people free. Why would anybody, especially one of us, betray you? They were grieved. And they began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, one by one, Peter said this, John said this, James said this, Matthew said this, surely not I, surely not I, Lord, I, I mean, we love you, we would never betray you. And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in a bowl, for the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. Again, bringing up scripture here. It is written to him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. While they were eating, he took some bread. And after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. Now, remember with me just a moment, if you will, back to Exodus chapter 12. Back to Exodus chapter 12, as the, 
as the children of Israel were about to be delivered by God from Egypt. They were about to be delivered by God to the uh, to start what turns out to be a 40-year journey and a 40-year wandering, but it, it, it started out differently from that. In chapter 12, it said, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you, and it is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and shall put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that same night. Roasted with fire, they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, among, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until the morning. But whatever is left until, uh, of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And it will, for it will go through all the land of Egypt that night. I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I will go through Egypt that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you, and I will strike the land of Egypt. Then he sets up the unleavened bread. He said, now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, and to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. That's what the disciples and Jesus are doing together in that upper room. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But on the first day you shall remove leaven from all your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. It's fairly serious, fairly serious consequence of just eating a little leaven. On the first day you will have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work shall be done on them except that it must be eaten by every person that alone may be prepared for you. He goes on and talks about observing the feast of unleavened bread. And that's what, our, that's what the disciples and Jesus are doing here. And that bread is, is represented being unleavened of of, of sin being removed from the camp, being removed from among the people. And, and at this point, the disciples are sitting there, and they're, eating the, they're getting ready to eat the unleavened bread with the Lord. They're expecting him to talk about the, the night of the Passover when, when the lambs were slain and the blood was spread on the doorpost and the lentils of the houses. And they're getting ready for him to say, this is what we're commemorating. The children of Israel, your forefathers, being delivered out of the land of slavery and out of the land of Egypt. This is to be remembered that this is what took place when God delivered your forefathers and he doesn't do that. Instead, he reinterprets it. And he says, take this, take it, this is my body. What? It's unleavened bread. That's what the Passover is all about, getting ready for the, uh, for the sacrificing of the lamb and the and the eating of the lamb, and, and then the destroying of the leftovers of the lamb. It, it, this, is, this is the Passover meal. And he says, this is my body. 
Then he takes a cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will never drink it of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And they, they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives where they prayed. What if you had this experience? What if the doctor came in and told you that your favorite uncle was right on, was about to die? The time is drawing near, and, and if you want to say your goodbye, you better get in and say it to him right now. He had no children of his own, and you were his favorite nephew, and he was your favorite uncle. He'd already told you that his significant estate, his significant wealth, had been left to you. It's all yours because he loved you that much. And you go in and you take his hand and he opens his eyes and he says, do you remember our tradition? Which you certainly do. Do you remember our Saturday morning breakfast together? When you were young, I'd drive over to my sister's house and I'd pick you up, take you to breakfast on Saturday morning, and then when you got older and got your driver's license, you would come pick me up, and, and we would go to breakfast together. We'd go get, ham, we'd go get pancakes and coffee, and, and we'd talk, and we'd laugh, and we would we'd talk about life. Would you promise me something? Of course, Uncle. What, what do you want me to promise you? Will you promise me that from now on, when you, it's simple, but will you promise me from now on when you drink your Saturday morning cup of coffee, you, you will thank God for the times we had together? Would you do it? Would you, would you make that promise to your dear old uncle who's about to leave you in a state of great value? Well, there's a real sense, and that's what Jesus is saying to the disciples. We've laughed together. We've learned together. I've taught you. I've led you. You've seen the miracles. You've seen everything that's taken place. And, and now I'm just asking you, you know, we've observed this tradition together at least three times, maybe four times the Passover. We've had it together. We've talked about it together. And now I'm reinstituting it. And this bread is no longer just unleavened bread about Passover. And, and this cup is no longer just a cup of thanksgiving and celebration about the deliverance of the children of Israel from, from Egypt. But now this bread is my body. And this blood, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. And, and we're celebrating this together because I'm about to deliver you from a slave and I'm about to deliver you from a bondage that makes the bondage in Egypt look like nothing. I'm about to give you deliverance from your sin. Your sins be forgiven because now the one who John the Baptist called the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I, I'm, I'm about to go and serve in that place. That unblemished one-year-old lamb, that perfect one-year-old lamb that had been offered for generation after generation after generation is now about to be absolutely replaced just as the unleavened bread and the cup is about to be replaced in thinking about my body and my blood. That lamb is about to be replaced by the perfect, pure, excellent, only real sacrifice. And that is me. I remember one person several years ago talking about the whole uh, the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy and conveying, trying to convey the meaning of the Lord's Supper in, in words that are more contemporary in our understanding. It was about when the Lord of the Rings was so popular and the movies were coming out. He told his story. He said, you know, the enemies and the weapons pummel the walls of the city of Gandor. As the city gates begin to give way, death and and the bitterness of defeat began to take hold, and the evil dark lord grimly claims the city for himself. But in that bleak moment of despair, the riders of Rohan come charging in with their horns blowing loudly, and they turn the tide of the battle, and they drive back the evil dark lord and his forces and reclaim the city. 
Tolkien writes in The Return of the King, he says, and I quote, Pippin, the hobbit, rose to his feet and he stood listening to the horns. It seemed to him that they would break his heart with joy because he knew the dark, evil Lord was about to be defeated. And Pippin, Pippin, never in years after, could he hear a horn blow in the distance without tears starting to form in his eyes. The memory was that great. And in reality, the Lord's Supper reminds us that when the evil, dark Lord looms over us, boasting, all is lost, you can't do anything, you are helpless, and you are hopeless, the Lord of light, Jesus Christ himself, steps forth and says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when you eat this meal and taste what redemption costs the Son of God to rescue us from death and from sin... It will always be hard to see the bread and look at the cup without tears of joy welling up in our eyes. This was his gift. This was his sacrifice. This was his work that goes beyond anything we could have imagined. How do you make the most of this supper? Jesus said, I'm doing this as a memorial. I'm doing this for you to remember. I'm doing this for you to think about the sacrifice and the covenant. So, so how do you do that? Well, you, you do that first of all this morning right here at Grace Baptist Church. You do that by remembering his death. That's what you do that where you're sitting. I want you to put everything else out of your mind. I want you to not think about what you're going to have for lunch or, or how long this sermon's going to go or how long we're going to be sitting here. I want you to put all that out of your mind. I want you to think about his death because he was preparing them for that that was about to come in just a, a matter of hours. Think about his death. That's what Jesus wants you to do. In other gospel accounts, he makes it clear, do this in remembrance of me. Do this as you think about what I'm going to do. When you take the bre bread and take the cup, feel them in your hands. Smell them with your senses. Touch them, smell them, taste them, and swallow them. And tell, your Jesus, tell, you, tell yourself that the death of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus for you was just as real, is just as real as that piece of bread and that cup that you're about to drink. He died as your substitute. He took on himself your guilt. It was for your sins and your iniquities that he was crushed, Isaiah said. It was for all the things that stood in the way of you having a relationship with the living God that he took upon himself. Because of that, it's absolutely certain and complete. It's absolutely finished, as Jesus would say from the cross. And if you are in that covenant relationship by faith, by grace, through faith, in Christ alone, then I want you to know something. You can let that assurance wash over you like a fresh cleansing and a fresh, clean bath of God's grace. Think about his death. Remember his death. Secondly, as you think about his death, remember his promises. At the, at the supper, Mark tells us he, he didn't just talk about his death. He, he didn't just speak about what was about to come, the, the giving of his body, the shedding of his blood. But, but he also talked about the future. He, he made the great promise about his second coming. He said, listen, I'm not going to eat this again until I eat it with you in the kingdom of God. Eat it and drink it new with you in the kingdom of God. When I return, and he is going to return, when I come back, I'm gonna, I'm gonna we're going to have the greatest celebration, 
that you could ever imagine. You think the 4th of July is a big celebration? You think the Passover was a big celebration? Both those are celebrations of independence. I want you to know, when we celebrate that in the kingdom of God, when I come again, that's going to be the greatest celebration of dependence you've ever known. Dependence on the living Lamb of God. Jesus is making an oath here. I will not eat it until I eat it with you in the kingdom. I'll never, never drink again the fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. In Bible times, when a, when a person took an oath not to eat or drink anything, it was always until something is accomplished. And it was always the strongest oath possible. And Jesus is basically saying here, he's saying, I will do this, or I'll die. He did die, but he died that he may live and live unto life. Jesus could not be more clear in that statement that I am absolutely committed to blessing you. I am absolutely committed to adopting you. I'm absolutely committed to making you a part of my kingdom, and I will celebrate it with you when I come again. That ought to give you hope no matter what you're going through. If you know Christ, that ought to give you hope, even if you're hurting. The disciples were hurting when they saw their Lord on that cross. But the reality of his return, the reality of his presence, brought them hope. So think about his death. Remember his death. Think about his promises. And thirdly, as we come to this table, talk with him. Talk with him. Yes, in prayer, but not just in formal prayer. Talk to him as though he's sitting right there in front of you, because he is. You, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, before the Lord kind of deals with them about misusing the Lord's Supper, he, he talks about this. He, he calls the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, koinonia. We know that word, it's in my day in college and as a young Christian, that was, a, that was the buzzword. We we're going to have some koinonia, koinonia fellowship, because it means fellowship. But, but he said in verse 16, he said, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? The word sharing there is the word koinonia. It literally is translated other places as participation, as fellowship, as communion. But, but what Paul is saying here is when we come to this table as the body of Christ, when we come to this table as a part of the covenant family and covenant community, we, we come sharing, participating, fellowshipping, and communing with God and with one another. That's how we don't sit at home and say, oh, I think, I'll, I think I'll observe the Lord's Supper tonight. Just go in the room by myself so nobody will see me or hear me. Or, and I'll just give me some bread and I'll give me some, some, some fruit of the vine, juice, and I'll, I'll eat it and I'll drink it. And, no, we do it together. We do it together as an expression of worship. We do it together so that we can say to one another, I remember. I remember what he has done. I remember his death. I remember his burial. I remember his resurrection. Is he present at all places, at all times? Of course he is. But there's a special. There's a unique there is a glorious reality when we really think about this table. Why do we do it once a month? Probably because you'd fuss if we did it once a Sunday, which I would really prefer. But we do it once a month. You say, well, won't it become ritual? Won't it become old? Won't it become kind of commonplace? It will if you let it. 
It will if you don't think about what it means. It will if you don't let yourself experience the reality of what our Lord was saying. This bread is my body, and it's given for you. It's a visible preaching of the gospel. This cup is the blood of the new covenant. It's poured out on that cross. It's poured out for you that you might be able to enter into a covenant relationship with the living God. It's poured out so that you might be able to talk to me. Commune with me, fellowship with me, know me, and know the living God who is the king of all creation. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the king of creation. We praise him because we can know him. Jesus said, what is eternal life? This is eternal life, that they may know the true and the living God. This is eternal life, that you may know Him. Be in koinonia with Him. Share in the bread. Share in the cup. As we come to this table this morning, let's remember that upper room in Mark and Matthew and Luke and John. All of us giving us a little, all of them giving us a little different prism look at it, you know, a, a little different shining of the light upon it. But all of them saying, Jesus is saying to you and to me, do this and remember. Do this and remember my death. Do this and remember my promises. And do this as an act of koinonia, fellowship, sharing in my body and my blood, and sharing that one another as we come to the table as we come to the table as we come to his table would you pray with me you pray and those who will serve the elements will join me down front but but you pray talk to him maybe you're hurting this morning in a very significant and deep way and you need to talk to him about that Maybe you're here this morning, you're struggling with a deep and besetting sin in your life. And you need to repent of that, confess that, and talk with him about that. I want to remind those that are in the foyer, we, we only serve the meal in here, so if you're going to share it with us, please come in. But as you're praying, confess your sin, repent of your sin, Walk with Christ in this moment, remembering his death, remembering his promises. Talk to him. And don't just take a piece of bread and take a cup and say, oh, well, we do it again this month. Okay. No, take it and say, this is his body. And we eat it. It's a symbol doesn't become his body, but it's a meaningful symbol. When you take that cup, don't just say, I wonder if this is Welch's or something else. You, you take it as a symbol of the blood of Christ. And you drink it. That blood becomes for you the same as the blood or symbol of the same thing, the blood symbolized for the Passover on the doorpost and on the lentils, it becomes the, the, the mark, the sign that I'm in Christ. And judgment has passed over me. Not because of the cup, but because of what the cup symbolizes. Christ's blood has been shed, and I, by faith, trust Belief or a beneficiary 
of that sacrifice. You continue to pray as we prepare. Scripture says that he took that bread and that cup and he blessed them and he passed it among them. As we pass this among you, I want to ask you to keep to hold the bread, think about it. Hold the cup, think about it. And then we will eat and drink together. In celebration of the body sacrificed and the blood shed on our behalf. Father, we ask your blessings on this cup. We ask your blessings on this bread. We ask you, Father, to give us spiritual nourishment through our remembering this morning, through our thinking about what you have done. All to your glory, all to our good. Lord, lead us to repentance. Strike down the idols. And lead us to your throne of grace in a new, a new way this morning. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's the promise of the cross, folks. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. And in in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. We don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. Groaning's too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He intercedes for the saints. It's not a special class of believer. That is all believers who are they are saints. He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined become conformed to the image of His Son and so that we would be the firstborn among, he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Wow. Paul says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? If God has won the victory, blow of the horn ought to bring tears to our eyes every time we think about it at the supper. For he did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us. And if he did that, how will he not now also with him freely give us all things? Who 
will bring a charge against God's elect. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised and who is at the right hand of, the, of God, who also intercedes for us, prays for us. Gives us his righteousness. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or sickness or, or, or depression or, or cancer or anything? Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Scripture says that on that night he took the bread and he broke it. He passed it among them as we just did. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. His body was not broken. It was pierced. It suffered. But the suffering was not so much the physical agony as it was the spiritual agony of bearing sin. As Paul said, he who knew no sin no sin, none, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So after he took it and passed it, he said to them, this is my body, take and eat it and do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. Up until this time, this has been a cup of thanksgiving for the Exodus. A cup of thanksgiving for letting the judgment of God, which in Egypt was, was indiscriminate. It, it was Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Egyptians, it fell upon if they did not have the blood but now he says this is the blood of the new covenant which 
was poured out that you might be in a new covenant relationship with God himself. He said, take and drink it and do this in remembrance of me. And after they had observed it, after Judas had gone out to betray him, it says they, they sang a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. Stood there on the Mount of Olives two weeks ago. Walked down the Mount of Olives. Thought about him weeping over the city of Jerusalem. Thought about him going on his way to Gethsemane and then from Gethsemane as we stood in Gethsemane being betrayed and being taken for trials and to the cross. He did that for us. And he did that for God. That God might redeem for himself a people. Men and women from every tribe and nation and tongue and people. God is calling those to himself through the sacrifice of Christ. They sang a hymn. We're going to sing a hymn. As our instrumentalists get ready for us to sing that hymn, as we prepare to sing it, it's not only a hymn to end the Lord's Supper. It's a hymn of commitment and a hymn of reflection and a hymn of invitation. If you're here this morning you don't know Christ, I invite you to Christ. Trust in him. Paul said, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess him with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. You don't have to have ritual. You don't have to have a priest. You don't have to have any kind of extra anything. You just have to come to him in trust. Confessing that he is Lord. Believing the truth of God raising him from the dead. I invite you to Christ this morning. Stand with me as we sing. God works and leads in your life. You be obedient.